Yeah, I'm going to go a bit rogue uh, on my publisher. I've been touring Trauma Farm for about 13, mo 13 months now, and it's definitely time to to get back to the poetry. Um, for some reason, uh, I'm, I've, always, I've just always been a poet um, ever since I started writing at the age of 17, but uh, I got on this sort of root of doing prose books, uh, which I've done quite a few of in the last few, in the last decade or so. But the poems are still where my heart belongs. And uh, so what I'm going to do is kind of give you, I'm not going to read all of it, don't worry. Um, <laughs> I'm sort of going to give you a, a kind of overview of, of some of the, um, the work that I've done over the years. Before I start, though, I would like to thank um, Carol and Liz and all the, the many volunteers uh, and people that have worked on this this great festival and boy have I heard some events uh, this weekend and uh, you should all be very proud of yourselves uh, for what you're bringing here to Durham. Uh, I'll actually, I'll sort of slip her in and around the theme of, I guess, some of the theme of Trauma Farm. Uh, Twenty years ago, we moved to Salt Spring Island uh, and started a small farm, and uh, of course, I've been losing money ever since. Uh, I always, I always tell pe uh, people that I, um, that I write poetry to support my farming habit. <laughs> <laughs> And even as a poet, I think that there's something really bizarre about this, uh, the, the economics about farming. <laughs> but um, one of the great things uh, about um, living uh, close to the land is that you do get to eat wonderful food, um, which sort of shows up. <laughs> but um, we, <laughs> and so one of the things that happened to me as I was there is I didn't realize it, but I unconsciously started uh, writing a series of food poems. And uh, this one, uh, it came about when there, were, there was a contest announced in the local paper and they, they had this bread book that they, they somehow got a hold of, this new book on making bread and so on. And the description of the um, book, I mean, it just sounded spectacular. And uh, I immediately started coveting this book and because uh, I am a real bread fanatic. And uh, they, they announced that there would be a contest uh, for anybody that sent in a, in a memoir, history, poem, or a story about making bread or eating bread or whatever. And I got so excited about the, the book, I just sort of went upstairs and wrote this poem, which, uh, as any of you know who write poems, uh, that doesn't happen very often, uh, that it just sort of comes streaming out of you. And, uh, and all in my excitement, I sent it off. And then I, as soon as I sent it off, I sort of felt kind of guilty, like, you know, here I am, the chair of the Writers' Union and 11 books of poetry, and, and I thought, oh, I, I really, really um, felt like a sort of ringer. I'm, I'm supposed to be a professional. I shouldn't be entering contests like this for the locals, and goddamn, I went and won the bloody contest. But, so I was really mortified at that point, right, uh, that I had gone and done this. And then I got the book, and the book was useless. <laughs> so, so I didn't feel so bad, right? Uh, <laughs> the, the pictures were, weren't very good. The book was you know, badly bound and sort of fell apart immediately, and uh, none of the recipes worked that well. So. But I did get um, this poem out of it. <laughs> and it's called Another One in the Oven. The great breads of memory invest us with odd hallucinations, the steam from a brick oven, the heat of life melting in the back of my mouth, yellow butter on a broken French loaf, hot red pickled banana peppers chased by a crusty chunk of peasant bread to conquer the fever of an odd combination savored by my grandfather after he fled Napoli. I have known some astounding breads in your belly and the way it swells under heat, pregnant with the population of the future, skin stretched as tight as a balloon, sprinkled with flour and the glow from the sun. I can trace our love like a feast that never cooled. Bread and raisins, bread with sugar and milk, bread and cinnamon, bread with mysteries like creation or birth, a woman's leaking breast, semen stronger than yeast. Old ways and ancient legends, bread and salt and punishment. Then someone dusted our hair with flour, the crow's foot creased our glances, and my joints started to sing on the stairs. But there was the life we devoured like a hot loaf, bread we ate in rain-verdant jungles, bread that rose slowly on glaciers, flat 
breads, hard breads, pita and focaccia and seven green and baguette and chapati, buckwheat and rye and pumpernickel and corn and culture, the stuff of life, the grain that never dies, the mill wheel that grinds and nourishes our slender bones. Everyone knows I've needed, I've devoured your bread or kneaded the dough of you in love and history and luck and circumstance. And it's true there are grim times when I am beaten down to the ground. Then I just rise, I rise, I rise again and we find love in the oven. We discover a taste for desire and honey and age and married secrets that becomes a recipe for a way to live, a way to make and break our bread together. Actually, maybe while I'm on the subject of food, I should, if I can find this here. Um, a friend of mine, this is one of the things that happens, of course, as you get older, uh, came back from the doctor's office, and, and I got this plaintive email from him. Uh, uh, actually, though, he's a wonderful poet, Joe Rosenblatt, for any of you who have heard of him. Um, quite renowned and sort of retired on the west coast now anyways he he wrote to me and said that's it you know i'm a let a water drinking lettuce eater right and um i'm going to um start an organization called carnivores anonymous and do you want to be a member <laughs> and uh i I, of course, naturally refused. I hope there aren't too many vegetarians around here. <laughs> um, hold on to your, um, your ears. <laughs> and I, I sent him back this poem, <laughs> The Hunger. I have decided to die unrepentant. I will eat meat until it eats me. I will eat it with carnal sauces. I'll eat it bloody blue rare or overcooked with carcinogens. I want plates full of kidneys and butter and lambs on spits, silkies and lemon sauce, chocolate-coated hearts, birds with enough courage to fly out of honeyed pies and steaks to sear on my barbecue until charred on the outside, the torn flesh bleeding inside. Give me pink hamburger and raw eggs. When the bright livid dawn comes, I will crow like a demented rooster and smile like a cat with a feather hanging from its bloody jaws. Chicken livers and onions, broiled sparrows, wild turkeys, alligators, ostriches, elephants, I'll eat them all. <laughs> And then I'll eat some more. My appetite for the world is larger than the world. Afterwards, I'll eat the furniture and the leaves on the trees just for dessert. And then I'll eat myself until nothing remains but this appetite for existence. One of the other things that happens, of course, when you're a writer, and I have sort of wrote this book that's kept me on the road forever, and uh, it's going to be good to get finally get back home next month. It's like been 13 months of touring. Uh, one of the things that happens is you end up in some strange places. Uh, sometimes you end up in exquisite places, such as where I am here in Durham. And, and uh, <laughs> no, a very lovely um, the James Gunn uh, in uh, bed and breakfast. I, I, God, they back to the food again. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the breakfast. I was late. I, cu I couldn't make the C.R. Avery thing because breakfast took so long. <laughs> I have a poem for breakfast, too, but I don't know if I'll do that today. <laughs> Anyways, but you also hit uh, some pretty unseemly places. And, uh, and I actually, I'm a friends with uh, poet Susan Musgrave, who uh, one day she was going on about hotels and, and, you know, getting stuck in flea bags and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and she was going on about everything. About it. And, and she said that she, had, she was so, couldn't stand the whole idea of all the dust mites and, and all that kind of things in the hotel rooms and so on. She, so she traveled with her own pillow. 
right? And uh, the, 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 all of this sort of lamenting uh, of dirty hotel rooms uh, got me all worked up. <laughs> so I wrote this poem for her, and it's called Praise for the Cheap Hotel. I have this friend who travels with her own pillow. She'd heard the stories of dust mites and detritus and the human ash left behind as we burn our own skin just being alive. How a black light will reveal the stains that remain from love affairs and porno films. I know another man who won't turn a tap off in a public washroom for fear of contaminating what he's just cleaned. Well. I've slept in the dirty sheets of others, laid myself down in the dust of my ancestors, slept with relatives unmet. You can't embrace beauty until you've kissed her ugly sister and loved her more. Lay me down, lay me down among the bodies of the living and the dead, even when the bed is dirty and cheap and the air conditioner hums amazing grace loudly over and over again. <laughs> Lay me down, lay me down in the bed of history so I can sleep with the secrets of love lost, of love never found, of love that died or was ruined. I want to turn on the lights and watch the cockroaches run for cover. <laughs> Let me sleep with construction workers and hookers, once rich stockbrokers on the fly from the law, young women who left home for a new future and destitute immigrants from Bombay. I am home everywhere, especially when I am broke and traveling cheap because that is when I am most rich sleeping in the dust of my community. Lay me down, lay me down among the thousand bodies in the bed. I am ready to sleep in the arms of the world. <laughs>